My friends, may the grace and the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Good morning. Welcome to worship among this people who are First Church of Christ and Mansfield Congregational United Church of Christ. We boldly proclaim that no matter who you are or where you are in life's journey, you are welcome here. As we come together in worship today, let us center ourselves in the spirit with these words from Julie Menard. Good morning, First Church family. Today's scripture takes us graveside to where Moses is laid to rest. Although in his last moments he is offered a glimpse of the promised land, he must let go of this vision while gazing out at the never to be attained. Moses was the first great Israelite prophet, perhaps one of the greatest leaders in human history. In his imperfections, he was a perfect example of humanity. Saddened by the events of life, he became impatient, restless, and acted out in occasional disobedience. The people he lived among failed to understand him. Life asked the impossible of him, to walk out from everything he was and knew, go into a place of uncertainty and discomfort, and spend his life there guided by the intangible. Had God read Moses' resume before hiring him, God would not have likely been impressed. Moses was born a slave, he had a stutter and a temper, and the only work he did before God called him was caring for his father-in-law's sheep. Yet Moses goes on to challenge the world's most powerful ruler and lead a people from oppression to freedom. He brings down the Torah and teaches the people the Ten Commandments. He is the protagonist of a story told around the world to this very day, a leader who felt doubt but persisted. While today's society might be tempted to juxtapose leadership and servanthood, the two are actually meant to go hand in hand. The concept of a servant leader is only confusing if we think of leaders as powerful, controlling people who make others do their bidding without a thought to their well-being, or if we view servants only as fearful workers toiling away silently on the sidelines. General Bruce C. Clark, an Army officer who served in World War I, World War II, and the Korean War, clarified the concept perfectly when he said, Rank is given you to enable you to better serve those above and below you. It is not given for you to practice your idiosyncrasies. True leadership is servanthood. Servant leadership turns the world's notion of power on its head. Instead of people working to serve a leader, the leader exists to serve the people. From his book titled To Bless the Space Between Us, the author John O'Donohue offers us a blessing for one who holds power. May the gift of leadership awaken in you as a vocation, keep you mindful of the providence that calls you to serve. As high over the mountains the eagles spread its wings, may your perspective be larger than the view from the foothills. When the way is flat and dull in times of gray endurance, may your imagination continue to evoke horizons. When thirst burns in times of drought, may you be blessed to find the wells. May you have the wisdom to read time clearly and know when the seed of change will flourish. In your heart, may there be a sanctuary for the stillness where clarity is born. May your work be infused with passion and creativity and have the wisdom to balance compassion and challenge. May your soul find the graciousness to rise above the fester of small mediocrities. May your power never become a shell wherein your heart would silently atrophy. May you welcome your own vulnerability as the ground where healing and truth join. May integrity of soul be your first ideal, the source that will guide and bless your work. In our gospel today, a lawyer asks Jesus a question to test him. Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? He said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. That is the greatest and the first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So friends, I wonder when in this past week have we failed to love God with all our hearts, our souls, our minds? 
When have we not loved our neighbors as ourselves? Holy God, you planted us by living water, that we might be rooted in justice and righteousness. You call us to be holy as you are holy. Assured of your love, help us to cast aside all fear, that we may love our neighbors as ourselves. Amen. And let us join our hearts and our voices together in the words of the doxology. Our reading this morning comes to us from the book of Deuteronomy. Then Moses went up from the plains of Moab to Mount Nebo, to the top of Pishka, which is opposite Jericho. And the Lord showed him the whole land, Gilead as far as Dan, all Naphtali, the land of Ephraim and Manasseh, all the land of Judah as far as the western sea, the Negev and the plain, that is, the valley of Jericho and the city of palm trees as far as Zoar. The Lord said to him, This is the land which I swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, saying, I will give it to your descendants. I have let you see it with your own eyes, but you shall not cross over there. Then Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab at the Lord's command. He was buried in a valley in the land of Moab, opposite Beth Peor, but no one knows his burial place to this day. Moses was 120 years old when he died. His sight was unimpaired and his vigor had not abated. The Israelites wept for Moses in the plains of the Moab for 30 days. Then the period of mourning for Moses was ended. Joshua, son of Nun, was full of the spirit of wisdom because Moses had laid his hands upon him. And the Israelites obeyed him, doing as the Lord had commanded Moses. Never since has there a prophet arisen in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. He was unequaled for all the signs and wonders that the Lord sent him to perform in the land of Egypt against Pharaoh and all his servants in the entire land, and for the mighty deeds and all the terrifying displays of power that Moses performed in the sight of all Israel. My friends, this is the testimony of Israel. Thanks be to God. And let us pray. Come, Holy Spirit. Come and light in our hearts the fire of your love. May the words of my mouth, may the meditations of each of our hearts be acceptable to you who are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, every year I make a list of the books I have read. It's nothing fancy just a note in my notes app where I list the title, the author, and the date I finished reading a particular book. I use it more as a motivation than anything else, pushing myself to keep reading, to keep exploring new writings. Well, the other day I finished Gopnik's biography of Andy Warhol and I was adding it to my app when I scrolled to the list's beginning. I was shocked by what I found there because if you had asked me if I had read the library book or Midnight in Chernobyl, I would have said it was years ago, not months ago. It has just been that kind of year, hasn't it? I also rediscovered that last February I finished Barbara Kingsolver's Animal, Vegetable, Miracle, a book I listened to actually as I was watching Devon play in the West Haven Winter Basketball League. One of the parts I remember so clearly from Animal, Vegetable, Mineral was Kingsolver's passage about 
planting asparagus. It connected with a story a member of our congregation also told me about her all own asparagus planting adventures. And that connection made it a heart memory for me. Both our fellow congregant and King Solver told of how growing asparagus is a three year long process from planting to first harvest. A process of hard work digging the trench, filling it with compost, tucking in asparagus crowns, and then waiting. Waiting three years for our first harvest. King Solver writes of how, in my adult life, I have dug asparagus beds into the property of every house I've owned and even rented, even tiny urban lots and student ghettos always leaving behind a vegetable legacy waving in the wake. Planting a crop she would never harvest. Leaving a vegetable legacy waving in her wake. This morning, we hear the story of Moses' death. After 40 long years of leading his people, of guiding them from slavery and through the wilderness, of interceding and pleading and conjoling on their behalf, Moses is allowed to rest, to enter the eternal sleep of those who have served God well. Having been one of those original hard-hearted and stiff-necked Israelites who disobeyed God's commandments, Moses, like them, was kept from entering the promised land himself, Present, prevented from tasting with his own lips the milk and the honey that flowed in the place God had pledged to them. It would have been easy for Moses to have given up at that point, to have become so angry and frustrated and hurt at the prospect of never living into the fullness of the freedom God intended for God's people that Moses had just quit, walked away from this disobedient nation, wandered off from this unyielding deity. But Moses did not. He knew full well that he never himself would step foot into Canaan, and yet he continues to lead his people forward as another generation is born and raised and formed into the people who can inherit the land that was promised. He leads them into a future he will never experience himself. He plants a crop that he will never harvest. As a reward for this faithfulness, God allows him a glimpse. A glimpse at the land that he has been traveling forward to. And just as a tiny glimpse of God's glory was enough, as we heard in our scripture last week, so that peak of the Holy Land was enough in our scripture this week. In fact, I wonder. I wonder if, in the end, Moses was given more than a glimpse. I wonder if his body was never found because, in the end, he was allowed to witness God's full glory, the glory that was so beautiful so magnificent, so overpowering, that it consumed him fully. And I wonder, I wonder what it is that we are called to plant that we ourselves may never harvest. What are the seeds of justice and compassion, of beauty and of peace that we are compelled to sow, knowing that we may never witness them growing into completeness, and yet we sow them anyways? What are the chains we are called to break, the injustices we are called to dismantle, perhaps not in their entirety because they are just too big to be undone in one lifetime, but which, through our persistent action, we wear away at. We wear down. Moses worked toward a promise he never knew fulfilled. And yet he participated in the very glory of God. May we so labor also, and may we be so rewarded as well. Amen. My friends, let us turn our hearts and our minds and our bodies towards God in prayer.
for the sake of all that is needed by the earth, by its people, by our churches. Let us pray. For people of faith in every land. For the Church of Christ. For world leaders and peacemakers and diplomats and government workers. For trees and plants, for creatures large and small, for pets and working animals, for oceans and winds and soil. For farmers in this harvest tide, for those who ship and store what is gathered, for those who cook and who serve. For children in school, for teachers and parents, and for those who have no schools. For all that we have not named, but which you know, O Lord, we trust that you will hear our prayer in the name of Christ Jesus, our Savior, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, friends, perhaps you are like me, and you filled out your pledge card, but you forgot to hand it in last week or mail it in or send an email to Donna. I invite you to do so if you have not yet that we might continue to plan for our ministry and mission in this place in the days and weeks and years to come. And as the hymn train leads us in this hymn of sweet hour of prayer, let us rededicate ourselves to that mission and that ministry with our gifts and with our offerings. Let us sing and let us pray. Yeah. 
And now, my friends, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us go forth in peace to love and to serve our God. Let us go forth in peace to love and serve one another. Let us go forth in peace. Amen.